95 AD, when the Apostle John was exiled to the island of Patmos, and God showed him this vision and said, write down what you see. He tried his best to capture and put into words what was happening through Jesus' words and what is going to happen in the future. Jesus begins this whole revelation with these letters to the churches. And he's complimenting and rebuking in each of them. Well, what does that have to do with us? Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he knows us. He knows Friendship Church, what we're about. Not just our deeds, not just the things we do, youth on Wednesday nights, and uh, women of the word every first and third Thursday, and bulletproof men second and fourth Thursdays, and Sunday night group and small groups and a mission trip to the Dominican Republic to help build a home or to build a home for someone who needs a home. He sees all that, but he also sees and knows our motives. Why we do what we do. Do we do it in response to his goodness? Or is there a part of us that thinks I'm going to do it to earn His goodness and blessing. It is a tricky tightrope that we walk, but He knows our hearts. So as we jump in today and look at the book of Revelation, and particularly the letter to the church of Philadelphia, I want to think about this concept, endurance. The phrase uh, is in uh, the middle of this letter, his comments to the church at Philadelphia. And he, and he praises them for patient endurance. So let's think about that for a minute. What is it in your life that you've had to endure? Not just what, what, have, what have you had to do. I mean, the things you've done, the places you've been, the accomplishments of your life. But what is it that might rise to the level of persevering through, or I had to, we had to endure something. There's a hint of, in this case, persecution. Remember in 95 AD, not only were the Romans and Greeks against the Christians, by this time, the Jews and the entire Jewish establishment, thinking they were going to stamp out this, this way with the with, by, by ca the capital punishment of its leader, Jesus, on a cross, it's now 60 years later, and they're growing, they're stronger than ever, and that establishment pushes back. If you were a Christian in Philadelphia, you weren't wealthy like maybe in Ephesus or Pergamum, a port city, a cultural city, a Roman command center, a government center, a literary center. Philadelphia was a rural, small place. They were agriculturalists, and specifically, they grew grapes. They had vineyards. They were known for that. And a bit of success and a bit of um, kind of an increase in their lifestyle because they began to make wine that was shipped all over. But the emperor in Rome didn't like the competition with Italian and Italian wine, so he ordered all of them destroyed. So all the vineyards were burned. How would you eat? What have you had to endure? Now, being here as long as I have, the good Lord hasn't seen fit to get to the end of the race yet. You guys haven't run me off as the pastor yet. Being here as long as I have been, I can look in your faces and we have traveled some things, some of us, that I know you have endured. Very hard things. That at the beginning of your career in this job or vocation, you never anticipated what was coming. 
the beginning of your family, when your first child was born, then maybe a second or a third, and then as the years go by, you never anticipated this would happen. You've had to endure. We endure, we endure estrangement. We endure health issues. I've walked beside a number of you. God has chosen to heal miraculously, unexplainably at times. God has chosen to heal at times with the, the miracle of modern medicine, the time and the place in which we were born and live. But God has also chosen, it appears, to not heal. I had two funerals this week. Families that, when they started the week, when they started the day, it's not how they thought it would turn out. When we live in community, as the church in Philadelphia did, as I hope we do, he talks about patient endurance. Have there been things in your life that would rise to endurance? Not giving up. Not leaving. Not throwing your responsibilities. I'm going to endure. I'm going to make it. We're going to get through this. And sometimes even that turns out differently than you expect. We might think we've got a way figured out to navigate forward and then... <laughs> That's not how it turns out at all. You don't see it coming. In 1976, I turned 16. And I got a license to drive. Who's the, who's the kid in the room that has most recently gotten their license? That might be... It might be, how long have you had your license? Yeah, yeah, just a few months. You remember how long you waited for, man, I can't hardly wait. You endured from the time from 15 and got your permit to 16 and you got your license. I don't know if that's enduring, but when I got, we got my license and when I was 16, my dad bought a uh, two-ton Ford a uh, livestock truck had livestock racks on it. They took the racks off of it, and now I had a flatbed. And he said, you and your brother are going to haul hay for money. I like the money part. That was pretty good. And so we did. We started. And uh, for a number of summers, that we, we hauled thousands and thousands of bales. But I remember one particular job for a person who was a member of this church who lived north of town, who had a farm west of here. I won't say his name, Gary Sowers, but he had a job for us. It had to be the end of July or the beginning of August, the hottest season of the year. It was not hauling 7,000 bales of wheat straw. That would have been sweet. Wheat straw's light. It's uh, fairly clean. What's the worst small bales that you can haul? Anybody old enough to know? 7,000 bales of red clover. It is the dirtiest. It's heavy. And he didn't have a great big open-sided barn we were putting it in. It was going in an old-fashioned barn with a loft and a roof that went like this. I was the oldest. So it was my job to make sure it got stacked in the barn right. My brother Just. How many of you remember people by the name of Jay and Jeff Wright? Dyke Dick, we hauled hay. And I was in the peak. It was 100 degrees. Couldn't breathe. When you, when you spit 
you, you, it was, your mouth was so full of dust, it was almost black spit on the, on the ground. And then, you know, your nose and, and the wasps. But we endured it. I endured it. So when I think about that question for myself, the Lord has been very kind to me. That's as close to endurance as I, my life gets. And there was nothing I could do about it because every time I turned around, just threw another bale up there. Or every time I turn around, I'm pushing another one in until all 7,000 were in. What have you had to endure? Some of you, it's been a diagnosis that you weren't sure you were going to make it. Some of you have been in a house that all of a sudden, because of the death of your spouse, got huge and empty. And how can I do this? The church at Philadelphia was enduring. And Jesus notices when we endure. John was enduring on the island of Patmos. Recently, some of you know this, that Kelly Jones went to uh, this area uh, about a month or so ago and it, on a um, European trip called the, the, the Steps of Paul. And so she was at Ephesus and she was at Pergamum and she was at actually, and she told me this morning, we went to the island of Patmos and they took us to what they believe was the cave that John had the revelation in. He's there. They tried to kill him, but they couldn't, so they sent him there. God met him and revealed the future to him. He sends the, the, the revelation to seven churches in that circle. When it gets to Philadelphia, this is what Jesus says to this church. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true. In each of the letters, Jesus identifies himself in some way, with some name or label or title. In this one, he says, These are the words of him who is holy and true. This is not just advice from a superior or an order from a governmental official, or even a love letter from a part of your family. This is a letter from the God of creation who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. When Mary was pregnant and the angel visited her, she said, you will conceive a child and he will be born to you. You are to name him Jesus. And his rule through the house of David will last forever. His kingdom will never end. Here's a picture of it. He holds, we sang earlier, the keys to Hades, to the gates of hell. He holds every key and he says in this, I'm the one that determines what's opened and what's shut. He holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. Then he talks to them personally and says, I know your deeds. Now just think about your life. Think about our life collectively together. Jesus says to you and us, I know your deeds. I know what you're up to. He says that to them. And he then gives them a compliment. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. He's saying, I'm giving you the secrets of the kingdom. You've been faithful. I have the key. I determine and I am opening it to you. You feel like God has ever opened things to you? Or is it only the enduring part of life where it seems like he's distant and quiet and hasn't opened. 
The Bible says that in the at book of Jeremiah, you will seek me and search for me. When you search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you. Are you searching? Or is God optional? Especially if you're enduring. Do you turn toward Him or do you run away from Him? Do you seek His answer and His comfort and His grace and His peace and His help even though you've made a mess of it all? Or are you looking to someone to blame? Have you ever thought you might not have formed it into it, the words like this? God, you owe me. And here's what I mean by that. I tried to live a good life. I go to church. I read my Bible. I even memorized. I gave some money to missions. I did all these good things. I honored my parents. I tr tried to raise my kids. I was faithful in marriage. You're making your case. I did all these things, God, so you owe me? The verse that Connor read out of Romans, that's not what it says. But we feel that. I live a good life, so I shouldn't get cancer. I live a good life, so my life should not spin out of control. It doesn't work like that. He does hold the key, and He does promise us when you search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you. But just like the things we've endured, my guess is it's not going to come in the way that we think. It's going to come something completely different. There are a few of you in the room that I know have endured very painful, heartbreaking, some of you even now, tragedy in your life. And some of you would say, that's when God showed up. That's when I really realized He's for me. I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength. You're exhausted. You're drained. That's part of endurance. I thought about Lance and other people, you've run several marathons, haven't you, Lance? Did you do an Ironman? I can't imagine, you know, an Ironman is like 384 miles running. It's not quite that far. How many is it? 70 miles running, total. Biking, running, swimming. Took you 15 hours? Five hours for an Iron Man? Okay, now you're telling me that. Okay, you know that's what he endures—a half a half Iron Man—and I endure waking up at three thirty in the morning, thinking, oh, "I wish I could go back to sleep." But he compliments them. I know you're exhausted, yet. You have kept my word and have not denied my name. Has life almost worn you out? Maybe Jesus is saying to you, you're seeking him. And it's not the results. Sometimes we, we stumble, we fall, we intentionally sin. We go off track. It's our heart, our motive. We don't always handle it right, but our heart can always be facing Him. And He will say to us, you have little strength, but you've kept my word and you've not denied my name. That was the church at Philadelphia. Now He describes it a little bit more. I will make those of you who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though you are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. He's writing to the church and he's talking to those who have kept Jesus' name, who have endured. But he's also talking to those who were fake. 
and they were the persecutors pretending. He says, one of these days, justice will happen. The wrongs will be righted, and, and all of this, you're playing games, you're, everybody's going to know it someday. And they're going to know that I have loved those who kept my name, those who endured. And he says that. I will acknowledge, have them acknowledge that I have loved you. Then he makes a promise. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Now, in chapter 6 of Revelation, the, the letters change and God is now revealing to John the future events of the Antichrist, of the Mark of the Beast, of the Battle of Armageddon, of, the, the, of Satan being thrown into the lake of fire, all those things. There are three ways to interpret the book of Revelation in the matter of when does the church believers, when are they taken out of, the, of all of these events? Okay? So all these events are unfolding. Somewhere in there, Jesus returns the second coming of Christ and He takes His church. All that then is left on the earth, the Holy Spirit is gone. The Holy Spirit now holds back evil. He's now gone. All believers are gone. And Satan has free rule. The, the Antichrist, the beast, have free rule. There are three ways of when that happens. Pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, or post-tribulation. Okay? Some people think that Christians endure that whole, it says seven years, that whole tribulation time, and then at the end of that, Jesus returns. Some people say, because it does talk about three and a half years, that He returns in the middle, that we endure half of it, and then He takes us out, and then the rest of the tribulation happens. Some people say that He takes us first, and believers do not endure any of the tribulation period. And there's Scripture that grounds all three views. This is the one, one of the Scriptures that grounds the pre-tribulation because he says, I will keep you from the hour of the trial that is going to come on the whole earth. So this is not a trial of Philadelphia. This is not a trial of certain families. This is not a, a tragedy or, or, or something happened. This is the whole world. And he makes this promise to them. And if you are a scholar that you are a pre-trib, pre-tribulation period when Jesus comes, and this is part of your, your um, argument, is that Philadelphia is a picture of all of God's church. Why would he remove Philadelphia but not Ephesus? Why would he remove Philadelphia from the tribulation but not Pergamum? He had compliments for the believers in all those churches. So that's their argument. However it unfolds on the timeline, Jesus has made a promise to them. Why? Because they have kept His command to endure patiently. What is it that you're enduring? Or what might it be This week. Next year. We don't know. But we know the God of creation who does know and who is in control and who loves us. This is how he closes this passage. I am coming soon. So the trial, the enduring, the persevering, the not giving up, he says, it doesn't last forever. I am coming soon. 
Hold to what you have. Haven't we heard that before? That was last week. And in fact, if you go and do a search for hold or hold on or hold fast, that's all throughout the New Testament. A number of places in Revelation. That's what Jesus is telling the church of Philadelphia and he's telling us, he's telling you. You're seeking him. Even if you don't always get it right, you're holding on. You're holding fast. I am coming soon. Hold on to that which you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. Okay, We'll never be separated again. You won't be enduring patiently, exhausted, completely drained. It's not going to be like that. You're going to be like a, a pillar of strength and stability. It's going to be different. I will make a pillar in the temple of my God never again to be separated from God. God at times, I will agree with you, is distant is silent, is where are you? We endure the desert. We endure the silence. And then all of a sudden, things begin to change. Short time or long time, he makes this promise. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. It's almost like maybe a brand, not physically, But in our soul, we belong. That's what a brand does. It it signifies who you belong to. I will write on them, the believers, those who've endured, that I promised the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And then here's one of the unique things. I will also write on them my new name. Jesus has a name that we've never heard. Remember, three letters ago, we talked about the white stone that has our name written on it that we don't know yet. Jesus has given us a name, His name for us, His name of love, of sacrifice that He bought us from sin and death. We have a name. We're a new creation, so He gives us a new name. Not only does do we have a new name, He has a new name that we will know on that day. Now, I got to thinking, well, what could it be? The names of Jesus reveal certain things about God. I am the Good Shepherd. I am the Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. I'm I'm everything in between. We sang earlier, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb of God. All of those are names of Jesus. Yeshua is the Hebrew name. But there is a new name no one has heard yet. And I thought, what could that be? What is he going to communicate with a new name that we don't have a sliver or a a glimpse of yet? The only thing I could come up with, when all of this happens, time is done. Time is no more. The new heaven and the new earth. Satan has been defeated. Evil is gone. Death is gone. He, The Bible says he wipes every tear from our eye. Behold, the old is gone and the new has come. So I wonder, is the name of Jesus that will be revealed someday to all who belong to him, will it be some name that communicates perfect, Completion. Done. Perfection. Death is gone. Disease is gone. Trials are gone. Enduring is gone. Fear is gone. And everything is made right. Could there be a name that that captures all of that? That when we see Him and when time is no more, we'll worship Him. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Yes. 
the amazing, the great I am. Yes. The beginning and the end. Yes. But would He give us, it sounds like it, a new name for Him that encapsulates all of those things. So how do we get from here to there? We're going to sing a song here in just a few minutes that kind of plays off of this as we close our service about this name thing. You notice that. And there are names all throughout Revelation about Jesus. Names mean something most of the time, especially in biblical, you know, uh, Yeshua, um, David, they all have a meaning. Now, in our culture, names mean less. In fact, we as parents play games with our kids' names. Uh, Jake and Kaylee have twins, right? Uh, they come to the early service, so you don't probably see them. Um, and they named them Click and Clack. No, they didn't. But they're twins, and so they kind of named them Dawson. Kaysen and Dawson. Kaysen and Dawson. I kind of want to call them Clawson and Dason. But anyway, is there some spiritual name to them? I mean, meaning behind their names? Probably not. We, Jill and I, named our three children. We played games with our three children's names. Okay, one of them is here. Um, all of their first names have a Y in it. They're two syllables, start with a J, and have a Y in it. And our goal was to be unique. You know, we didn't want a name where there were five other kids on the softball team where you say, Claire, and five girls look at you, you know. Um, so we, we wanted their, their name to be unique. Their middle names rhyme, but they're not spelled the same. Okay, so J.C. Lane, L-A-Y-N-E, Jarden, Shane, S-H. A-N-E, and Jensen Dane, D-A-I-N. We kind of play games with our kids' names. So sometimes names have a tremendous meaning, sometimes not so much. But there's a day coming. Jesus knows your name, I hope. And He calls you. We sang about that earlier. He calls you out of the grave. Do you know Him well enough? That when He calls your name, it's familiar? Let's stand together as the band comes forward because we're going to sing about that He knows our name. We're made new. So let's celebrate that. And there is a day coming when the enduring is over. We'll have to endure no more pain, no more sorrow, no more grieving, the new heaven and the new earth. And it's all dependent, not on your deeds, it's dependent on the name of Jesus. When He calls you, and He calls you by name, will that be a glorious day? in your life, or do you dread it, or do you fear it? If you fear it, if you're not right with Him, if you're not sure what that means, you can be. He loves you. He died for you. And He calls you by name.